Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Be More podcast, where we inspire you to be more of every role within the Salesforce ecosystem and beyond. For today's session, we are exploring what it takes to be more solution architect. And I'm joined today by Gordon. So are you able to introduce yourself to our audience, please? Well, hey, Tom, thanks for having me. Hi, uh, my name is Gordon Lee. I am a Salesforce solutions architect in the uh, with experience in the nonprofit industry, but also with experience in the for-profit area. Uh, I've been in the Salesforce ecosystem now for about as long as I can remember, for about 17 years, I believe, at this point. Uh, started off really, really young. And so it's been a, quite a journey, and I'm expi- excited to talk with Tom today about just kind of like going, for, graduating from a sort of accidental admin to a solo admin most of the time to now, you know, coming into the, uh, the Salesforce Solutions architect. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for for joining us today. And maybe we can start out by explaining to our audience, if there is such thing as like a generic solution architect role, like how would you describe that? What types of roles, responsibilities are we talking about there? Yeah. So I'm going to give you the favorite answer that I'm sure your audience loves to hear, which is uh, it depends. Yeah. I think I think especially with my experience in the nonprofit space, um, solutions architects a lot of times are often unheard of unless you are in a very big nonprofit that sometimes mirrors your mid to large size for profits. So the role itself, I would say it's a good definition I've heard before is that depending on the type of solutions architect you are, you're either uh, your knowledge is probably a mild wide and a few inches deep, or it can be a few inches wide and a mile deep. And those are sometimes more right. like your technical architect. But some solutions architects, just because of the way they came up, are much more prone to, let's say, nonprofit cloud or sales cloud or service cloud. And so you might know a lot more about that specific area just because. But I would say that the person who usually sits in the solutions architect role really has to bridge the gap, not only between people and technology, but also processes, and also have a very solid understanding, obviously, of the ecosystem of products that Salesforce offers and how it can plug into not just its own ecosystem, but perhaps into other ecosystems as well, depending on the needs of your organization. Yeah. Okay, awesome. And I love that idea of a interconnected system you know a sales will describe it at customer 360 right correct yeah there's a lot yeah. i mean i remember i remember starting off all those years ago and, and really they were just only talking about service cloud and sales cloud and now there's i don't know i think 12 plus different clouds out there if i'm counting that correctly maybe 20 i think yeah okay yeah 20 so there's a lot there's a lot and i and i remember just to date myself i remember when certifications weren't even a thing i remember when they first rolled out the admin certifications and i was like why would anybody want something like this so look yeah. at us now tom look at us now. you know times are changing Salesforce is definitely pushing right now for everyone to get an ai certification or, or maybe both of them so yeah things things do shift things do change and then as you say we've got all these different clouds now and non-profit cloud which i primarily work with like is sales cloud and service cloud together plus a whole bunch of industry stuff so definitely keeps you on your toes right yeah, and I and I I even just talking about the solutions architect role. I remember that title when it didn't exist, and we had to kind of come up with that on our own to sort of like say that we're more than just an admin. We're not quite a developer, or you know, I don't have developer skills. Like I had to pass the thing to get the certification, but I definitely don't live and die um, inside Apex and and coding all day long. And so you, yeah. we were just trying to figure out a way to call ourselves instead of saying like advanced admin or admin developer or whatever. We wanted something that was like yeah. not a technical architect, but what's the difference? And so I think the solutions architect um, title kind of came around organically within the community. And I think that Salesforce saw it and then it adopted it and now made an official certification out of it. But I think if you've been doing this for a while or that you start not only looking at specific clouds or that you're looking across your stack and across your ecosystem and you say, how do I get these things to work together? Okay, great. Now, how, now how do I then bring in these other things to work together? I think you're, you might be a solutions architect if you start thinking about things that way. So not just within, again, not just within the Salesforce side of things, um, but also other systems that might work well with it as well. I think anybody can be a solution architect, right? You just kind of work your way up through those ranks. Like we, we both did. Mm-hmm. And now we're sat here on a nice podcast t- talking to each other about it. So yeah, that's that's great. So now thinking about the role of a solution architect, what type of other roles do you interact with as a solution architect? Like admins, developers, like what type of people do you speak to and, and work with on a daily basis? Yeah, 
I mean, all of that above, I would say not only right. your admins and your developers, but sometimes and a lot of times even the stakeholders from the other departments and the other teams, because, you know, I think you need to be in some of those calls at times, right? It'll, it'll, you'll learn after a while, like which ones you need to be more present at. But in the beginning, I think anytime your admins and developers get pulled into a quote unquote Salesforce meeting, it feels like you should be in there as well, right? Because you, even if you're a fly on the wall, you want to be able to kind of understand from a different perspective what they're asking for and what the requirements are. Your admins and developers might be diving deep into the technical forays of their mind when they hear these requirements and say like, okay, I know what I need to do. I need to build a flow. I need to do this. I need to do that. But from a solutions architect point of view, you've had to kind of take more of like a 20 to 40,000 foot view while at the same time understanding the limitations of the products that you currently yeah. have. So that you can say, okay, what you need down the road, like we can build for that with what we have. We're going to help scale for this thing down there. But maybe we don't commit to requirement number three because that's going to require something that's just not feasible at the moment. And I think that's the role of someone like that to say, like you, you, you practice those chops when you're an admin, and even so when you're mm -hmm. a developer of like pushing back and saying like maybe we don't do that or like clarify that for me. But as a solutions architect, I mean, you have to definitely be willing to say, hey, that's not going to fly on this phase. Like we, we can deal, we can deliver these four things for you, but that fifth one is just not going to happen this time around because of X, Y, and Z and, and do it diplomatically, obviously. Um, I would also say that there's times because of those meetings, you might also then be with like your, your leadership, like your C-suite or your, your VPs or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Similarly, you have to be able to, to deliver the news to them in non-tech speak. If they're going to ask, like, why can't this thing turn red when I want it to turn green? They don't want to hear about the fact yeah. that flow can't handle it, right? You need to be able to explain that to them. So I'm sure you've been in a lot of those calls as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think kind of what I'm pulling from that as a summary, it's about relationships, right? And building those relationships, having your, your clients or your users or your stakeholders trust you that you're making a decision that ultimately leads to a scalable solution. Like within Salesforce, there's limits everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's important to consider as well. And then also, like, sometimes I consider, like, a client might come to me and they'll be along the lines of, oh, I want this, this, this. And I said, okay, that's, that's great. But you're not ready for this. You can't do the first. Bit. Why would you want, like, version four, the version five of that process when we haven't even built version one yet? So right, there's part of that, right? Yeah, that's completely true. I mean, the first thing that came to mind when you said that right now, because I have, I have two girls, I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old, you know, the six-year-old's always trying to play with the older kids and saying like, dad, I want the, I want the training wheels off my bike. And I yeah. have to say the same thing. I'm like, you're not ready for that yet. Like I, I might let you try out for half a block and then when you fall, mm -hmm. we'll dust you off and, and redo that. But you're not ready for that yet. Like you that first learned how to pedal before I can get yeah. you off the <laughs> training wheel. So similarly, right, like it's the same principle. It's all about the relationships. And I think you put it out very correctly. I think, you know, Salesforce is always saying that trust is its number one value or its number mm. one virtue. And I think trust is like the biggest currency that you can have with your stakeholders because they're looking at you as the admin, as a developer, as a solutions architect, that you are the subject matter expert in your field. And so they need to trust that you are going to be the one that is able to handle it. And, and you do that by obviously reassuring them and then also delivering on what you're going to say. But that comes with the expectation setting of like, we can't do that for you this round, or that is going to require $40,000 commitment because, you yeah. know, the system doesn't have an open API and we need to talk to them about that. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The thing is about that negotiation piece and ultimately managing those expectations after you set them. And I think that's, that's super important for quite a few roles within the ecosystem as well. So thinking about this now as a solution architect, do you play that role full time or are you perhaps a little bit consultant, a little bit admin? Maybe, for example, if you're working for a Salesforce partner and it's a smaller partner, you might be a solution architect, but you might actually be the admin as well and the consultant right. as well. Like from your experience, how does that typically uh, work? Yeah. So in the nonprofit space, again, since there's usually not a lot of solutions architects, we're very used to wearing multiple hats. Right. Cool. It doesn't mean that we're doing everything, but you have to very much dive into those areas more so maybe than you would if you were at a big for-profit that has a huge segmentation of roles. Right? If you're at a huge for-profit like many of my friends and you're a solutions architect, you're like, okay, I need to meet with my admins and my developers. 
That means I have to schedule 10 people around this meeting on Friday or, or whatever and bring them all into the room together. In the nonprofit space, it'd be like, nope, it's going to be me and two other people, and we need to figure this out. And so it, it does require you to put on a lot of hats, especially in that area. And it's enjoyable, but also at times, you know, you might not like it as with any other position. And there are pros and cons to all of it. But I think the biggest thing is, to your point, is you got to remember to, to keep the relationships going. And then also, obviously, stay on top of your tech, technical acumen. Just yeah. because you're a solutions architect and you, you have the twenty to 40,000 foot view doesn't mean that you can take your foot off of everything. Like You might not know the nuances of what the newest flow feature is, but you should know that flow is capable of doing these certain things and that your teammate or whoever's in charge of that instance can be the one that dives into it and figures out those intricacies, but you don't need to necessarily know that. But you also, again, need to be able to put on those hats a lot, especially the nonprofit side of saying, hey, I can figure this out, but I also just can't. Sorry, I just can't get my foot off the, off the, off the gas for it all the time. Yeah, no, you might want to. Yeah, I think that's important as well. And certainly thinking about that and talking about flow as, as we often do. Like, mm. I think it's also important to think about how in the future you're going to be able to maintain that thing and look after that thing. Like if the business process changes and it's in apex or it's in flow, what's easier to maintain and perhaps what's quicker to maintain? And I know that's a really hot topic. Like people mm-hmm. have a lot of different spicy opinions about that in the sales Mm. ecosystem which is absolutely fine but that's something that i think about with with like my clients they're not going to be able to maintain apex so there's there's no point giving them apex so that they're going to struggle probably in some cases to maintain the flow so i think that that's part of it as well would would you agree yeah i mean to your point you have to evaluate this on the case-by-case basis it depends Mm. And you have to figure out what's going to work for them. Like, it's easy to build something that works for them today. I think it's harder to think about what's going to work for them in a year from now, or even just six Mm. months from now. And I think that's where very much the solutions architect hat comes in a lot of times, right? Because I remember that my days of an admin, when you were getting into it, you would start off and be like, yeah, I'll just build this thing. And, and, you know, you ask for this thing to turn red when this thing turned green, like, I'll build that. But when you dig into it and you start understanding that, like, they don't have the capabilities to handle flow, they don't have the capabilities to handle Apex. And, you know, you can wish and, and shake your hand in the fist as much as you want to say, like, <laughs> at someone, but that's not in reality, right? Like, we all know what we would want if we had unlimited resources and we had this magic genie giving us everything. But you've got to think about the position your stakeholders, your partners, your, your organization is in and say, okay, how do I build something for you that not only works today? But as much as possible, given what I know now, will work in the future as well. No way you can predict anything that's going to happen, right? But you just need to work with the information you have and try to set them up for as much success as possible. Yeah, exactly. I think if only I had a dollar for every time somebody said to me, it depends. We'd be be hit with a lottery bus and we'd be sipping Mai Tai somewhere, I think. Yeah, yeah. Or Boba's or something. Definitely Boba's. Yeah, okay. So now thinking about this, if there's someone out there that's listening to this and they're feeling inspired and they perhaps want to blaze their own trail to a solution architect type role, what tips, advice would you give to that person looking to start out? Yeah. So I, I very much tell my team and people this is that, you know, when you're starting off in, in any kind of technical role, especially in Salesforce, where the technical things are so vast, you know, focus 90% on the technology and 10% on the people, right? And and you have to because you're learning all these new vernaculars, all these new functionalities, all these new limits. You have no idea how to even navigate the language yet. But as you progress, right, and if you want to grow into this role of, of much more sort of stakeholder interfacing, uh, much more um, executive leadership, much more being in the room and sort of coordinating in a way, more so than, than, than admin or developer, I would say you need to flip this around and, and focus 90% on the people and 10% on the technology. Because you will get to a point where you know enough about the technology and everything that you learn about it will just sort of incrementally get you there. But the people part, the trust part, the the relationship part is a huge piece of this, right? You need to be able to explain yourself, your logic, your reasoning, and why you recommend at this time that you go down this path versus this other path, even though there's five other voices telling you that you should be going down some other path. And so that is... And this is where I see a lot of times where um, the natural progression for BAs to kind of step into this, given that they know more and more about technical stuff. Because the technical skills, for the most part, and I'm going to generalize here, are pretty easy to learn. Given enough time, 
you can learn the technical skills. It's much harder to pick up on the PR skills or sorry, the soft skills. And so that is where a lot of times people forget to focus. And that's where I think that's a lot of times where people shine is that if you know people who are great in those type of, of situations and scenarios, focus on learning about like your public speaking and delivering, you know, stories and how to how to basically sell these particular ideas and persuade people. That's what I would, would recommend that you focus on. Not only on that, like you're again, given that your technical stuff is up to par, that like you understand that, right? Like that should basically be like just the foundation, but then you need to start working on sort of the how to build trust how to build relationships, how to make sure that people understand what you're trying to tell them without losing them in all the technical jargon. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's super important and super key because you will be working with stakeholders or a leadership team or somebody that won't understand what a flow is or or things like that. So it is important to be able to kind of describe the pros and cons of something because as we all say, it depends, right? There isn't maybe a, a golden solution for everything. So I think that's that's super important as well. And I'm going to throw in an extra question, but keen to know what your opinion of this is. Do you think it's important to specialize in a particular industry vertical as well? Because that's certainly what a lot of sales or partners do. Yeah. What, what do you think about that? I think it's going to depend. <laughs> That's another dollar. I think, okay, I think if you're a Salesforce partner firm, like if you're a partner, yeah. right, you cannot only specialize in one unless that's your niche, right? Like I know a bunch of firms out there, like Cloud for Good is a very good example. They focus primarily on nonprofits and only nonprofits. So if you're a for-profit, you would never go to them. They probably wouldn't help you out if you're a for-profit. They might, but they really focus on just the nonprofit space. So I think you can take that similar approach, right? Uh, from a personal level, you can say, all right, I'll either cast a wide net and start learning everything about everything, right? But then you're going, again, a mile wide and a mile deep. And I think that's where you get burnt out. There's just no way you can know all this stuff. And so if you want to specialize, I remember back at college when I knew I had friends and they knew they wanted to be doctors and they knew they wanted to be lawyers. And so they were very specialized. And I was like, that's great. Like, you know, that's what you want to do. So do it, right? But if you don't, I would say, think about it. Take some time to explore it and figure out if if you're going for it for the right reasons or if you really only care about it for some other financial reason, for example. But if you look at your past experience and what you've done and think about sort of what inspires you and what makes you sort of like feel like you're invigorated to kind of get up in the morning and do the work and which industry you want to work in, that's where then you might then have a clearer lens then of like where to focus if you want to stick in the Salesforce ecosystem, right? Like if you're like, I love banking and i love financial services well then yeah. there's a cloud for you on that yeah you probably wouldn't want to work in the health cloud on that one right for example so you've got to figure that out that's why it will very much depend to your part to your point i think earlier like if you're a partner firm or or a consulting firm a lot of times they have to cast a very wide net just because that's the number of clients they serve if you're an accenture or a pwc for example but that for good again very niche, very focused on on specific ones. And there's hundreds, if not thousands of those types of examples everywhere. Yeah, exactly. I, I certainly work for a partner that just does management for nonprofits and so not even just nonprofits, but just a particular bit of nonprofits, mm-hmm. right? And we will obviously work with nonprofits in other areas too. Yeah. But primarily that's our focus and our kind of um, alignment and what we're working towards is that specific niche within that yeah. the industry so yeah it's, it's good to know your your thoughts on that and thinking about this now as someone that's been on perhaps a little bit of a journey to get to solution yeah if you were to start again was mm-hmm. there would there be anything you would do differently and i know einstein is uh, a great thing uh, and don't forget you're going to owe me another dollar if you say it depending. well that's one this one's a little easier because it's obviously like what would i have done differently right mm-hmm. so um i Definitely, I, I definitely would have uh, focused a lot more on the people skills, what they call the soft skills, um, a little bit more early on um, in terms of, and, and I focused in on that a little bit in terms of like public speaking and, you know, speaking like an executive or like how to make sure that I explain things in a way that it makes sense to non-technical audiences as well. So I remember, I think my first five or six years, I was so deep into the Salesforce Kool-Aid that like everything out of my <laughs> mouth basically was like, from the page of the pages of Salesforce help. And 
which is great. Whenever I went to user group meetings, when I went to Dreamforces, when I went to you know conferences, right? People were like, "Oh yeah, let's go geek out about process builders or S controls or Visual Force pages." Mm-hmm. Which again, dating myself. <laughs> but then I would go into a, you know non Salesforce rooms, and we would be talking about things, and they're like, "There goes that guy just talking about like Salesforce things again." And it's great to be an expert in your field, which is what I've been known for, but then you alienate everyone else who wants to have a conversation about, let's say, a business process that has nothing to do with Salesforce, but maybe could be helped by it, but they're turned off by it because you're just very focused on only like what this one thing can do. So the people skills, definitely. Um, and then learning how to just like explain very technical things and simplify, simplify, simplify to the point mm-hmm. where it makes sense to your audiences, whether they know it or not. Like I, you know, I basically try to try to explain to your, your mom or your, or your parents or your family thanksgiving or or holidays like what it is that you do or what salesforce is see their eyes glaze over well you've got some work to do in terms of like how to explain it to them so that they understand it a little bit more yeah exactly and i think that's that's a great example scenario that perhaps we can all be practicing with our own family members so great solid advice there so thinking about the solution architect role what particular Mm -hmm. skills or attributes do you think this person needs and i know we've We've touched on a few already, like relationship builder is potentially one. Do you think there's like curiosity and, and anything else there that's important? Yeah, the learner's mindset, the curiosity yeah. piece is a huge thing. Like every little, you know, every new thing that comes out, um, you know, let's just again take sales first, for example, like you've got to kind of dive into it. Not to say that you have to know every single little thing about it, but I think that curiosity mindset comes into play of like, okay, let me see what they're telling me is new. Let me see what it is about it that um, is good and potentially bad about it. How can this help my existing organization? You know, obviously, how much does this cost? Um, yeah. And, and just going down that line of just like always being curious and always questioning to the point where then you are, are very much from a point of, of being curious, not so that you can find a gotcha, but so that you can understand like, okay, I was looking for this missing piece of a Lego for my puzzle that I couldn't figure out, like, can this thing solve it or not? And if it can, or if it can't, what are other things out there that might? And that's where you have to start, like, doing the research on your own and figure this stuff out. So the curiosity piece and the learner's mentality, the learner's mindset, I think is a key, key thing beyond what we've just, what we've already talked about. Yeah, awesome. And I think that's super important as well, because Salesforce itself is continually evolving. Like, we've got AI everywhere at the moment yeah. and there's there's mm-hmm. going to be something else and perhaps that's going to shift in the future to a different thing but it's definitely important to keep up to date because otherwise your knowledge is ultimately kind of growing stagnant and you're going to be left behind because you're going to say oh no wait you can't do this in flow you have to use apex when perhaps you were able to do it in flow for a couple of releases and you just didn't know right do you think that's important to kind of staying up to date yeah, I was going to talk to you about this a little bit because like up to date is obviously like, you know, open to interpretation, right? There's right. some people who are like up to date is like, I need to know that syntax of that line of code I need to write in order to not yeah. then invoke this call anymore. It's like, no, I don't think for me, that's not up to date. My for me up to date is like sort of what I said before, which is understanding the basis of what this technology can do. And then thinking about like, how does that interact with everything you currently have in your tech stack and even your data stack? And how can that actually help? whichever client organization or, or partner that you're dealing with. It's always a lot. There's, again, there's never going to be a, a, a way that you know everything. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. If someone were to come to me right now and be like, Gordon, you're a solutions architect. Tell me about CPQ. they are like, nope, I can't. I don't even think I can tell you what CPQ stands for. I get it wrong every time. I think it's like flick product quote or something. See, I don't no. know. Wrong. I don't know it, right? But like, you can't, you can't, I feel like you can't know everything and it's okay right. to also own that, right? I think a big part of this is also like, if you're in a room with people and they're like, tell me about this, I'll be like, you are, I am not the person to talk about this. It's like, I'll find you someone else. I've got this guy named Tom. He could probably come in and tell you about CBQ, but I can't do it. And so you need to be also be able to communicate that as well. And, and not just say like, I don't know, but have an, a solution. It's built into your title. You are a solutions person. You yeah. have to always be finding some sort of solution, whether even when it's not you. Yeah, definitely. And I think in that type of situation, you would pop the question and be like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll speak to my colleague about that one. And then 
come back to maybe CPQ can help or CPQ can't help. But yeah, I think that's really important because that helps build trust as well, which is certainly really important thing for sales too, right? Yeah. I, mean, I think just dropping the whole text dive for a moment, like you all have people, we all have people in our lives, right? Who we know very quickly, whether they're sort of hiding something from us or glossing over something that might actually yeah. be important, you know, like they're yada, yada, yada it to you somehow. And then you get that red flag and you're like, I don't, I'm not quite sure about that person. You want to avoid that as much as possible. And you know? like as, as a solutions architect, you are at a higher, I would imagine, higher echelon of trust within whoever you're dealing with. And you need to be able to communicate that and present that in, in sort of every format or in every way that you're, you're interacting with your clients or, or with your stakeholders. Yeah, definitely. Tony, totally agree with that. So now thinking about this as an opportunity to change or make people more aware of about the role of a solutions architect, like, is there a common misconception? People think solutions architect and they think this thing, mm -hmm. and as a result, you're a solution architect, so you can only do this, or you're really good at this. Is there anything like that that comes to mind that you would like to kind of clarify for our audience? Yeah, I think I think the common, the most common thing I come across is that like, oh, you're a solutions architect, you should know how to code, mm -hmm. or you're a solutions architect, you should be able to figure out this like very technical thing like CPQ in like four minutes. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, nope. no, what it means is that I'm aware of it and I understand it to a certain point And I know that that's the product that needs to do. But also my role as a solutions architect is also a lot of times indirectly managing people and having to pull in your alliances and your stakeholders across the org to solve the problem together. I think I think a lot of times when you're an admin or you're a developer, it's very easy to solve a problem by yourself, right? You're like, oh, they need a field, like I'll figure it out. I can feel they, they need this uh, class or this test class, I can figure that out. Yeah. I think the most rewarding and also frustrating part sometimes about being a solutions architect is that someone comes to you with something and you're like, all right, who do I need to talk to to get this working? And it's not just about like solving it by yourself anymore. And so I think, to your back to your original question, there imagining that someone in this role is just a highly technical person and and you have them right and I, but i think that's where the distinction comes in with like a technical architect mm -hmm. those obviously are very very highly skilled and they can talk about in depth like the entire product of the ecosystem is like which api calls and which limits and, and all these other things i think a solutions architect very much is much more focused a lot of times on the process based side of things as well as the the relationship building and not necessarily like learning knowing how to write lines of code to, to figure things out yeah i can totally relate to that myself yeah sure i can debug the code or scrutinize the code but i can't write mm -hmm. it myself from scratch so yeah i think that's that's really important and a good thing to, to clarify thinking about this now and it's been a, a great session i've certainly picked up a few things from from <laughs> you today but we are kind of wrapping things up before we do mm -hmm. go What's a way for people to connect with you and learn more? And are there any particular pieces of content that helped you kind of on your journey to Solutions Architect, do you think? Yeah, uh, so you can definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. And I'm sure we could put that up afterwards. I I, I still have a X slash Twitter account, although I'm yeah. seeing that <laughs> yeah, same. less and less now. I also co-lead the San Francisco nonprofit group in, in San Francisco. Uh, and that meets once a month on the second Wednesday of each month. So you can find our page and, and connect with us there as well. Um, I will I will shamelessly plug an article that I wrote a while back about um, not volunteering in a nonprofit, um, and there are, that's a whole other podcast that I think we can okay. get into. But that article we can post it somewhere afterward. It's on Medium. But basically, that has helped me in sort of just like thinking through the, the mindset of what is it that you're actually trying to achieve, and how do you go about that? Right? Just because you have learned one way of doing something doesn't mean that that's always the best way. Even when it's the entire industry sometimes telling you that this is the way to do it, right? Like think through it and figure out like, does this actually make sense? We're in this whole thing about AI, right? And I think you and I were talking about before this call is that like, yeah, I love it. We work on it all the time. I'm, I use ChatGPT all the time also. But then when you think about actually implementing it at let's say the nonprofits that, you're, you're, that are your clients or even at the organizations that I'm involved with, there's no good use case for them at the moment. Marketing and other teams will tell you that they want this and they want that and they want this, but can they even handle it? Can they even, you know, if they don't have anyone who's going to be able to configure it or who can actually speak to it, or let's say clean the data before the AI yeah. can even make use of it, you know, like you've got to, you've got to question that, right? And so at the risk of another dollar, it's going to depend. Okay. Well, at this point, you're going to be out of dollars very soon. But 
Yeah, I think that's that's really important. And also something like that has to have a whole bunch of governance around it as well and, and best practices too, which is somewhere where a solution architect should be able to help as well. Yeah. It's a relationship thing, isn't it? Yeah, the governance oh man, and the and the framework and the privacy yeah. implications. Yeah, that's another two hours of a podcast that uh, we don't want to get into. Yeah, that, that's that's another episode of of itself. So thanks for, for joining us today. I think it's been a really great session and hopefully we can inspire some more people to be more solution architects. So thanks again for your time. Thanks, Tom. It was fun. 